coffeewithrest.com. Um, I'm going to be blogging this week about my message. All of it goes back to the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and the reason I chose that particular um, example is, is I think this is one of the greatest conversations in the Bible. It really is. It's, it's up there in, at least in my top five. Malachi is one of my big ones. The whole book of Malachi is nothing but a conversation between the prophet and God whenever you read that passage, uh, read that small book at the end of the New, uh, Old Testament. But, but this one right here is such a revelation. I know why it's in the scripture because it's there to help us see something that quite obviously, if it wasn't there, I don't think we would get it. And I, you know, it would just be one of those things. We would just miss it if we didn't see Jesus in action in a real conversation. There's another one in John chapter three with Nicodemus, which is, is a great conversation there that you can also learn from Jesus how to be able to tell others about, about him because that's what he's called us to do. That's what he wants us to do. Um, why do we do it? You know, a lot of people say, you don't have the right to tell people about your God and all the rest of that stuff. And it's not about right, it's, it's our calling. Because Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Well, what are you making them a disciple of? You know, your favorite car brand? You know, your favorite restaurant? No, you're making them, you're making them a disciple of Jesus. And we know that the first step to that is to lead them to accept Christ into their life. How many of you accepted Christ into your life? Say amen. amen. Uh, give me some thumbs up online also. And so nations in this play go to make disciples of all nations. Nations is understood. We, it, it translate in English nations, but it's better understood people groups or tribes or generations. You can, you can kind of use those three words. They'll, they'll, they'll weave in and out rather easily. So a generation would be like uh, millennials or Gen Zers or boomers. That would be a generation. A tribe would be like um, uh, addicts or moms, or uh, bikers, or uh, car enthusiasts, you know, that's a, that's a tribe. You get them all together, they're a tribe. You know that. How many have ever been to a car show, right? Okay, oh, good. Or a people group, like transgen transgenders is a people group, or Ukrainians is a nationality, or a people group. There's so much that is in front of us that we see that when we take 2819, man, we can't miss we're so, we were throwing those axes, and I'll tell you what, for about the first 30 minutes, and we weren't doing good. Yeah, we, you know, we were just miss, 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 and finally we kind of got it dialed in, and we started to be, be able to do this. But this target is so easy, you can't miss. Amen. This is the way Jesus described it. He said, wherever you are at, there's somebody there you can lead to Jesus. Amen. And that's what he was trying to tell us in Matthew 28, 19. But why do we do it? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 24 that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He was sent to the lost sheep. Bah. Mm -hmm. You're the sheep. I'm the, we're, we're, we're sheep. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm sent to the lost people who need a shepherd. That's you and me. Without a guide, we are doomed to blunder through our life very painfully. Amen. Anybody ever picked up on the pain part? Yeah, without, without God's help. Now you say, well, if I accept Christ, then the pain will be removed. No, that's not what I said. But you have a place to take it. You have a place to do something about it, to do something with it that he gets glory for, which is more important than anything else. We need a guide for life the life that he created us for, that he created you for. God created you for a purpose, for a reason. There's a reason why you are here. It really is. And you may be discovering it. You may, be, you may know it. Regardless of where you are at on this journey of faith, keep pursuing that purpose that God has called you to. Amen. And thus, God, Jesus commanded us to teach people what he wanted them to know. Because in that purpose, we need to know what does Jesus want us to do, not what I want to do. I, I got a lot of things I want to do. And I, I talk to God about that. And he answers me. You know what he says? No. Okay. All right. So keep going. But before all of this can happen, we read in John chapter number 13, where Jesus commands us, love one another. Yes. Amen. Love each other. Amen. Now turn to somebody there, look at you and go, 
I love you. In Jesus' name, I love you. I love, love you. You can say I love you. Yeah, it's okay. So there was, Ben, people are talking to you. They are, um, that's easy to do in here because most of us kind of like each other. On any given day, you know, there's, you know, but yeah, okay. But now if I asked you to go to work tomorrow and do the same thing, uh -huh. oh boy, different, different ball game, isn't it, completely altogether. But you still love them. Maybe how you say it is different. But you still show love to them. Matthew 22 tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart. These are Jesus' words. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and no, what's the first word? All. All, all. And all means all. All, all means all, all your soul and all, what's the next one? All your mind. Yeah. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then the second, second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes I see that in play in people's lives. I, I see people treat other people badly and I'm thinking, why are you doing it? And then I see how they treat themselves, and I'm going, well, okay, I get it. Come on. When you treat yourself poorly, you'll treat others poorly too. Yes. Let God love you, you can love others. That's a whole different sermon. Now, Satan would like for you to believe that it's impossible for you to share your faith and be a witness for Jesus. I, it's not impossible. Hard? Yeah, it can be hard. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible. In, in fact, next week, I'm going to introduce you the not-so-secret weapon in order to making it possible. But uh, for now, I want to focus on this conversation that we're about to have. We're living in a time whenever the church can thrive, not die. Come on, amen. We're living in a time when we can lead people to a relationship with Jesus now more than ever. Amen. That's a truth. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, this person and that person and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. This isn't about that. And that's a phrase I want you to hang on to today. This isn't about that. Some, some you know, if, if we have powerful worship, this was a great experience that we had up here this morning. The Holy Spirit's moving in our lives and a great joy in this place. Today was about joy. It really you could just see it. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's up to, but some of you just needed an infusion of joy Amen. here today. And, and, and you, you received that. I could yeah. see that all across the auditorium as we were leading here in worship today. But if you were thinking about that, you say, well, I, I couldn't do this because I couldn't do this because this isn't about that. And, and so often, hell tries to tell you a lie, go figure. Mm. Satan lying, hmm, that's all he does, people. Amen. And he tries to say, you can't experience joy because this isn't about that. You can receive the joy regardless of your experience, regardless of the circumstance that you are in right now. Regardless of whatever you're thinking about God or me or this church or the person three rows over or what about your tomorrow, that has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that your God wants to pour out his presence into your life and he wants to fill you with it and he wants you to experience his joy and hope and life today, right now. Yeah. Now, we must love God. That's the first thing you do. If you're going to be a witness, you've got to love God. It's very hard for people to be credible whenever you say, I don't like Jesus. I'm just saying, that, you know, it's, it, it, that's really, really hard. Or here's another one is that, that, you, that you say, um, I, I, can't, I can't believe in God. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I mean, I believe there is a God, but I just can't believe in him. You know, that just really just kind of just rips you up. Uh, uh, your witness, I should say. It really just takes things apart, doesn't it? If you can't believe, but love him, love him. That's what Jesus told us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, all your strength, all of it. Now I could go into a long dissertation about this and make a big deal about it, but here's the bottom line. You just want to make God bigger than you. Amen. 
You want to make God bigger than your problems. You want to make God bigger than your addiction. You want to make God bigger than your struggles, your wicked heart, those thoughts that you can't get a, get a hold of. You want to make God bigger than the marriage flying apart at the seams, the finances going down the toilet. You want to make God bigger than all of that. Oh, brother, yeah. And hell would like to tell you, well, you can make God bigger than that whenever you fix this. Mm. You ain't fixing anything because this isn't about that. Let me say it again. This isn't about that. Right. You, you have to come and put him first regardless, just regardless. Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, I made a mess of it, Lord. Oh, like you're the first person. Have you read any of those people in the Bible? <laughs> come on. Amen. We won't be the last either. And he still loves us. He yes. still loves you. Thank you. God wants you to share what you believe, not what you think. God wants you to share what you believe, not what you think. What's the difference? The first is based upon your relationship with Jesus. That's what you believe. The second is just an accumulation of knowledge or information that you just share. Well, I know what the Bible says, but I don't know if I believe that. See, you know information, but you don't believe it. That doesn't work. I believe that the Lord heals people. I believe that he can do miracles. I believe he can raise the dead. I, can, I believe he can reach the lost. I believe he can do anything he wants. Yes. If, if my Lord in heaven speaks, the stars in the heavens have to obey. Come on. And if, if the universe and the physics of the universe has to obey God's word, whatever he says over my life, I'm fairly certain is going to happen and take oh, place. Yeah. I believe that he speaks over me. I believe he speaks. And I pray that all the time. God, speak your will, speak your hope, speak your life, speak it into my life. Amen. That's not name it and claim it. I'm just asking God to look down and say, bless them. Give them some favor. As I need him. It isn't about me making him do anything. It's about me humbling my heart and saying, Lord, I need you. Yes, amen. I need you to say something over me. Please, your will be done. And because he's without sin, he is perfect. He can judge me perfectly. And because his will is never wrong, whatever he says is always right. Not that I like it. Amen. Hello? Oh, brother, amen. But, but my God never fails. Now, Acts 1 8, you will receive the power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I've repeated this verse again and again, and yeah, you're going to see it again next Sunday. But, but it's there, the witness. A witness such as one who offers enough evidence to conv convince others that you are a follower of Jesus. In a court of law, would people be able to say, yes, that's a follower of Jesus? Would there be enough evidence to be able to prove it? That's tough. Because I know some of us will be like, well, there's enough evidence. And well, then there's, uh-oh, there's <laughs> contradicting evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do this, but, ooh, I shouldn't do that. Hello? And you're sitting there thinking, how do I resolve this? By the grace of God, his unmerited favor upon you, God says, I know where your heart is. Yes. And all we want is to be more like Jesus. That's it. Mm -hmm. We just want to be more like him. Amen. And if we, as, as we become more of his will, as we become more like him, the evidence grows. The body of evidence gets, becomes greater than ourselves where people will look at us and go, now there's a follower of Jesus. Come on, brother. Now, Come on. John 4 tells us about this conversation, a real life conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Let me set it up for you because this is really interesting if you don't know this. Jesus is Jewish. That's not supposed to be a surprise. We all know that, okay? Jesus is Jewish. He's from the tribe of Judah. And the culture of that day was a male-dominated society. And it was very racist, by the way. Jesus wasn't, but the world he lived in was, okay? Now, women were not allowed to testify in court. And neither were Gentiles. We'll get to them in a minute. 
uh, minors, the disabled, the insane, or the undesirables. If they just didn't like you, they wouldn't let you testify in court. Mm -hmm. Women could not engage in commerce unless they, it was a desperate situation. So she couldn't do her shopping unless a slave was to accompany her because she was to wear a veil so thick that she could not converse with men. So the slave would do, the transaction would do the speaking on her behalf. G Jews viewed anybody that wasn't Jewish a Gentile. And Gentiles were often seen as pagans. These were people who were false worshipers. They worshiped stuff, you know, stupid stuff, but you know, stuff nonetheless. They were, they were idol worshipers and uh, the Jews would insult them by insult them by saying, you're unclean, you're a dog. They would do it, they'd call them dogs. And the uncircumcised, just, ugh. That, that, that it was, these were just slurs in those days, is what they were. Now, Samaritans, oh, they were the worst. So 700 years prior to Jesus, the kingdom of Israel has been divided. It's been conquered and the north has been conquered by the Assyrians. And the Jews who live there began to intermarry with the Assyrians. And so they kind of produced this half Jewish, half Gentile tribe. And they decided that they were the real Jews and they were the true Jews and they had their own version of the, of the law of Moses and they had their own temple and they had their own place on Mount Gizrim where they would, they, they would worship and they considered the temple in Jerusalem and the Levitical priest order to, to be illegitimate, that it was wrong. So Samaritans looked at the Jews and said, you're wrong. And the Jews looked at the Samaritans and said, you're wrong. And the uh, Jews would look at them and go, you're half Gentile, you're half dog anyway. And the Samaritans would look at them and go, you're just a worthless, good, illegitimate, nothing, dumb bunch of, and this has gone on for hundreds of years that this had been happening and taking place. Now let's go to John chapter four. So on this day, Jesus sees a woman at the well. Okay. And she speaks to him. No, no. That's a no, no. You're not supposed to do that. She is a Samaritan. Jesus, by his culture, is obligated to call her racial slurs. To trash her. She is a worshiper of an idolatrous false religion. So you're not even... You're not even, you're half Jewish and, you're, and that half isn't in, in any good anyway. And, and you're worshiping a false God. And she's been married five times and is currently in a cohabitation relationship. So this is why she says in verse nine, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? You shouldn't even be speaking to me is what she's saying. In fact, you shouldn't even be here Jews were known for walking around Samaria. It took hours, but they just would not know. It was the other side of the tracks, and you didn't go there. This woman is saying, I'm a re reject. I'm a loser. You hate me. I know what you think of me. And I know for many of you, you have probably met people who, after discovering your faith, looked at you and said, Christians hate everybody. Christians are racists. Christians are horrible, hateful people. And here we are in the same conversation that we engage with in people today. I want you to see how Jesus dealt with this. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Amen? Amen. So how did Jesus do it? He does not see, remember last week, how Jesus would see people? He doesn't see a half Jew, idolatrous, worshiping woman with serious relationship issues. He doesn't see it. Come on. He chooses to ignore it. Mm -hmm. I just don't see it. He sees a woman struggling to live and who's hungry for hope. Now, I would guarantee you that phrase right there that most of the people around you are in the same boat this woman is in. They're struggling to live and they're hungry for hope. Come on. And if there's two things 
the message the church needs to be sending into the community, into its cities, and into this country and the world is, there is hope. There really is real hope. And your struggle is not worthless because there is a God that is in the midst of it who will see you through. This is an apt description of people that we see every day. So this week when I wrote, I wrote the pre-part of this sermon on Tuesday, I sat there and I thought, you know what, I'm going to pay attention this week. Now, I'm not judging, I'm just observing, so don't read too much into this, all right? How many of you heard what I just said? Okay, good, all right. So if somebody says otherwise, you are blessed by me to tell them, no, that's not what he said. All right, good, bless you. But I went around and I just kept a journal of people and what I saw, what I saw around me, what was going on. A mother is concerned about the future of her daughter. A wife concerned about the future of her husband. A son is concerned about the future of his grandmother. A wife and mom struggling to make ends meet for their family. A man confused about his responsibilities as a man and as a provider. A woman that is absolutely terrified of the economy. A frustrated barista who is fishing for a new job from a customer right in front of her. An arrogant customer who demands that her sandwich be delivered to her table. A salesman desperately trying to make a living. A cashier who couldn't focus on her job and couldn't scan all the items that we were trying to purchase. I'm, I'm going through and it's just the list goes on. And I would see all of these people around me. Did you see people like that this week? Now you're thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But see, Jesus saw them in the moment. Come on. In the moment. Right there. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. We can see it. We just don't think about it. But in that moment, what can you do? Do what Jesus did next in verse number 10. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Jesus isn't ignoring the Samaritan's woman's problems. He's just making God bigger than her. He goes straight to it. He made God bigger than her. And you're surrounded in a world today where you need to make God bigger than their their problems. Sure, you can serve them and you must. You can meet needs. You can pray for people and all the rest of that stuff, but never fail to make God bigger, to make him greater than. That's what we do. We make God bigger than our our problems. That's the first place you go. We make God bigger than cancer, bigger than divorce, bigger than death. We make God bigger than the world, the economy, and politics, and and philosophical issues. We make God bigger than false religions. We make God bigger than the threats and the demands and all of the conspiracy theories. And uh, there's so much I could just go on and on and on about. But God is bigger than all of that. And then here comes the confusion. If you want to know what happens next, I'll show you right here. It happens to all of this. She asks, well, where's your rope and bucket for the well? If you're going to get living water, the water's down at the bottom of the well. Where's your rope and bucket? I've got a rope and bucket. Where's your rope and bucket? Now, in all honesty, when you look at that and you understand what Jesus is saying and you understand what she is asking, it's a stupid question. (laughs) She didn't get it. And a lot of people around you are not going to get it. You're going to have to be a little bit patient. But I also want you to see in John chapter 3, Nicodemus asks if he must return to the womb of his mother to be born again. Huh? Yeah, you're right. You heard it right. You know, do that. And then in Matthew 16, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to rise from the dead three days later. And Peter rebuked him for saying it. (laughs) Peter, listen. Shut the mouth. Listen. You'll learn something, boy. He didn't. Jesus tells her plainly in verse 14, 
those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. He just makes it clear. This isn't about that. This well isn't about that living water. It's just just a metaphor, ma'am. Come on, make make the connection. He has to work with her. Help people make the connections. Help them make the connections. Be patient Mm -hmm. with them. She says she wants this new life. I really want what you're offering. And you've all heard that before. I, I really like... I really like the brochure and what you're saying here. I, I, I like the sales pitch, whatever it is that they, they call it. I like what you're offering here, but then she challenges his theology. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you did what? <laughs> this is Jesus. When he speaks, theology is created. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Think about this here for a second. And so she chill. I'm like, oh, the Lord loved her. He really, really, really did. I pulled a stunt like that. That'd be a lightning bolt, and then that'd be the end of me. But the, the, she challenges his theology and says, Samaritans are the true Jews who worship at Mount Gizram. And Jesus' response to that is, this isn't about that. Come on, brother. Yes. You're going down the wrong road. Get over here. People need a guide in life. How many of you know that? I mean, we, we we're raised and we we're taught everything and we're and then, and then they turned us loose and we didn't have a clue what we were doing and everybody who knows that say amen. amen. But life is easier when you have people to guide you yes. to be able to do that. And people will say to you, but what about the church? You know, the church did this and the church did that. This isn't about that. Well, I went to church one time and this pastor did this or something did that. Or what about this guy online? Or what about that pastor over in another country or another state or whatever? And about all, this isn't about that. Come on, brother, yeah. One of the great lies that hell was trying to tell you is, is that everybody in the Christendom, everybody in the church world, all the pastors and everybody, they're so horrible and they're so bad. There's nobody that you can lead to Jesus because of everybody else's nonsense over here. No. This isn't about that. Yes, because what you're offering them is your faith, not their faith or lack thereof. Come on. And my answer to them is, is that you're right. They messed up. And, and I hope they're growing in their faith so they will stop it. Amen. But I got this thing called a Bible and there's a lot of people in there did way, way worse, a lot worse yeah. things than they did. Yeah. And Jesus still loved him anyway. And he loves me. He'll love you. Get him back on track. What about all the injustice in the world? Why does God allow this to happen? Why does God allow that to happen? This isn't about that. This is about you. This is about you. Well, I'll follow God whenever he fixes the world. What? (laughs) Are you? No. Well, I'm this religion, or I'm that religion, or I'm this faith, or I'm that faith. This isn't about that. It isn't about if you're Baptist, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, whatever. It's about you and Jesus. That's what you need to focus on. This isn't about that. Jesus made her the most important person in the whole world. And he let her see herself through his eyes. Yes, yes. And that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Let them see who they are in the eyes of Jesus. He loves you. Yes. Amen. He died on a cross for you. Why? To save you from what? Sin. What is sin? Everything that you did wrong that God said, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Well, why did he have to die for me? Because... The, When you break the law, you got to pay a price. And the price for this being broken is your life. We're talking about eternal things here. We're not talking about a speed trap on the road. You may think it's not that big a deal, but to God, it was. So he sent his son. That's not a birth son. 
That's the son of God. He is God. To die on a cross, but three days later, he walked out alive out of a tomb. And there's proof all over the world for thousands of years that everything he said is true. I've seen miracles. Tell your testimony. I've seen God move. Tell him what you know to be true in your heart. Let your faith be real. What if they reject me? Won't be the first time, won't be the last time. Mm -hmm. But Jesus looked at her and told her in verse 26, I am the Messiah. And what do we say? He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one who changes your life. He's the one that's bigger than your problems. He's the one who sets you free. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Notice how he says it. It's the way he said it. He said, he didn't say, go, go and, and, and you get smart and then figure out how. No, he just said, go and make disciples. It's about them. Jesus said, love one another. It's about them. He's making it, everything he says, it's, it's about them. Amen. It's about them. Come on. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Right there he says, it's about them. Our faith is about them, Come on, not us. Yes. My God shall supply all my needs. I know promises of God. I have stood on them. And he has never failed. Come on, yeah. And I'm finding a whole new slate of, of promises to renew and to stand on for, for my life today, for the future of my family. Carrie talked about what you, your 40th wedding anniversary. Mine's in just a couple of weeks. And, and, and I'm thinking 40 years. When did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Love God. Make him bigger than your fears. Make him fi- bigger. Make him bigger. You say, well, how, how do I do that? Worship him. Amen. Come on, brother. Let him set you free. Lord, help me. Love others. I don't like them. Let me pray about that. People are looking for hope and they want answers and they're tired of fear-mongering, negative culture that is bashing them and canceling them every day. People want to know that they have a future today, tomorrow, and forever. And they want to know that their children will have a future today, tomorrow, and forever. And their grandchildren will have a future today, tomorrow, and forever. And that future is in the hands of a living God. It's not in a system. It's not in politics. It's not in philosophy or education. It's not in mechanics. It's not in mathematics. It's not in your kids going out to college and they learn something really smart and they make a ton of money. Never made anybody happy. It's about their relationship with Jesus Christ because it's about them. Jesus died for the kids. Jesus died for the youth. Jesus died for single adults. He died for people that we don't understand. He died for them. And if he died for them and walked out of a tomb and he still loves them, then we love them too. But they're a hot mess. So are you. Just some of you are really good at concealing it. (laughs) Think about that. If I know it and you, okay. Okay. Anyhow, you're not concealing it. Anyhow, sure people want less stress and more money. Who doesn't? Hello? Oh, come on. You're looking at me like answering that question is a sin. Who wants less stress? Say amen. Amen. Who wants more money? Say amen. Amen. Give it to Jesus and let him teach you. Works every time. Well, I, 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 you know, I'd like to be a multimillionaire. It probably ain't going to happen. You don't give knives to three-year-olds either, so. Hello. 
the Bible does have something to say about it, but he, they, people need somebody to lead them. This is why we say leading people to a new life in Christ. People just need a guide. They need some leadership. And we're living in a world today, in the church and outside of the church, that is void of it. it, it it's just, just oh, I could go on here, but it, they need somebody to teach them, mentor them, encourage them, pray for them, somebody that will care about them. And that's not a position. It's called a relationship. It's called getting to know one another. I don't want to know them. Now you have to because you just, I had a friend of mine. He, he, he just, for years, in Bible school, and he would just, Lord, Lord, don't send me to Africa. Don't send me to Africa. Don't send me to Africa. Guess where the Lord sent him? Africa. Africa. And, and um, my, my friend, he, he, my roommate, he was always, Lord, don't send me anywhere warm. I want to go where it's cold. So I was on the other side of the room saying, Lord, send him to Alaska. We didn't get along all, all that well. Send him to Alaska. Send him to Alaska. He got in northern Michigan, Wisconsin somewhere for, for a long time. I, and I was smart enough to say, Lord, your will be done. I'm okay with warm. I'm just saying, I'll just say I'm okay with it, but Lord, you will be done. Oftentimes the people that push your buttons are the ones who can teach you the most about the love of God. And rather than avoiding them, embrace them. And Eric and I were having this conversation the other day. There's a huge difference between patience and tolerance. Amen. Jesus doesn't tolerate you. He's patient with you. Yes, amen. Because patience comes from the Spirit. Amen. It's a gift. And our impatience is usually our need to control the situation. Parents, I just taught you something there that will help you forever, okay? Just, will they ever straighten up? Maybe, but be patient with them. Whenever we love one another, you say, Pastor, just, just love them. Um, Jeffrey and I had a conversation this week about John 10. And there, Jesus describes this uh, imagery of a shepherd leading the sheep into the barn into a pen. And in that passage of scripture, it says there is a gatekeeper. In your old translations, it's called a porter. We would say doorman. That's how we would, that's how it translates for us today. If you've ever been to New York in the high rise buildings, they have a doorman. And there, there was somebody paid and their job was to open the gate for, to let the sheep in as the shepherd would herd the sheep into the pen to keep them safe. And in that, we were, we were in our conversation, the question popped up is, who's the gatekeeper? Well, Jesus is sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus is sent to the sinners, to the people who need him most, us. Where does he herd us into his church? Not the building, you and me. Amen. Our witness is about us as a community, as a family, not as an organization or a structure. Our witness is about what God is doing in our hearts and lives right here in this very moment. And some of you are rejoicing greatly in the Lord. Some of you are struggling in this moment. Some of you are suffering in this moment. But God is still here, none the same, to everyone who is here to give their faith unto God. But who's holding the door open to let them in? The people who witness. Amen. Your witness holds the door open for people yes, that Jesus is leading to you, amen. to his church. We're the gatekeepers. We're the doormen. Allowing people to find safe sanctuary in the love and grace and forgiveness and the power of Jesus Christ. Stand with me if you would please. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for your many blessings and I pray that you pour out your spirit upon every one of these here. 
Lord, I pray that you will continue to minister to our hearts and lives for the next few moments. The challenge that you have presented us with is to ask ourselves, am I a witness? Am I holding the door open? Am I holding the door open for people or am I, am I just, I hold it open for friends and family or I just hold it open for a select few? And I want you to know today that if you find yourself in that place where you're, you're being selective or where, where you're just ignoring holding the door open altogether, you're not alone. I think a message like this as it should carry through all of church, all of the churches of every denomination and flavor and size, that everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be their salvation and savior and Lord and master, to be their leader, their sovereign, their king, should be also someone who offers that love they have received to others generously. You see, this isn't about that. Your fears isn't about this. Your, your problems isn't about this. Your insecurities isn't about this. Whatever your family says isn't about this. Whatever religion you came from, it isn't about this. This is about you and Jesus right here, right now. Lord, prepare me to make you bigger than all of my problems. Prepare me to show others your grace, your love. Help me to be able to do this. And with every head bowed, eye closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, have, I don't know this love. I don't know Jesus. I know church. I know Bible. I know religious stuff. I know some Christian songs. I know a lot of those things. But I don't know Jesus this way. I don't know him really in a way that motivates me, that changes me to live and, and become more like him. That's not the kind of relationship that I have. And I need that relationship. I rely, I realize right here, right now, I need that now more than ever. If you're online, whether you're here, in-house, it doesn't matter. This is for you. But if that's you here today and you say, I, wanna, I want Jesus to step into my life and start leading me to be the person he created me to be. I want Jesus to come in and change me to be the witness he created me to be. I realize I'm not fulfilling my life and much of my struggle is because I'm so empty, void of his presence and I need the Holy Spirit to fill me. If that's you here today, you say, yeah, pastor, that's me. Just put your hand right up and down. It's just between you, me, and God, and I'm going to pray for you in a moment. That's it. But if that's you, say, yes, pray for me. Thank you. Make eye contact with me. That's okay, too. Thank you. Who else here would say, yes, I need to ask God to change me, to make me more like him. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Anybody else? Yes. Praise God. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Hallelujah. Anybody else who say, yeah, that's me. That's me right here, right now. If you're online, put some thumbs up online and say, yeah, that's me. Take a step of faith. Hit the key. Do that. I believe that God answers prayer. I believe God will answer your prayer. We're going to pray with you. I'm going to lead you in prayer. We're going to pray with you. You're not going to be alone. I'm not going to single you out because this is between you, me, and God right now. But I want you to know that he wants to do that. And, and the next steps you take are important for you to be able to realize this, this promise that God has given to you for it to become a reality in your life. So everyone here, pray together with me. Father in heaven, I need you. I am not who I'm supposed to be. I know that, but I need your help to become the Christian you want me to be. I 
want you to be bigger than me. I want your love to flow out of my life like a river into the lives of people who need you now more than ever. I want to know your purpose for me today and forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give glory to God in this place. Amen. And Lord, I pray a blessing upon every person here that you will touch them, guide them, lead them, direct them, take care of them as they continue to pursue this. Hell, you don't have a right to steal what the Lord has given today. So we're not listening to you. You, Lord, I pray, help us to know we're a follower of you. We'll admit if we're bad or good at it, you can tell us that. We're okay with it. But we would be rather be a bad follower for you than a great follower of hell. And so, Lord, we ask that you use us to be a witness this week. Show us, let us see people, let us love people, let us talk to people, let us help people. Turn us loose, Lord. And we'll thank you for it. In your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. How many glad you came to church this morning? Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give me some thumbs up online if you enjoyed the service this morning. God bless you. You may consider yourselves dismissed. <laughs>